Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Transcendiates and Swedenborgian Community Online. Uh, we are happy uh, to connect with you today. And today we have a very special guest, uh, actually a return guest for the online community folks, uh, Ellie Schnarr. Greetings, Ellie. Hello. Thanks and I for am, having me on. Oh, our pleasure. You know, we love having you on. You, well, we'll get into it, how much amazing stuff uh, you're up to. Uh, and, and my name, for those of you who don't know, I'm Corey. Uh, the Reverend of the online community and a volunteer host uh, with the Swedenborg Foundation's Transcendiates. So um, be sure to subscribe uh, because I think you'll enjoy this conversation because we are going to be talking about Emanuel Swedenborg's the 18th century mystics uh, internal breathing. Uh, it's a pretty amazing topic Ellie that you've kind of dived into here lately. Yeah it um, I think it started out with my my fascination with um, the brain from a purely kind of neuroscientific perspective. And then I got into, um, of course, I, I was I was raised in the church, so I, I had some awareness that this stuff existed all my life. Um, but I got really into Swedenborg's work on the brain and Swedenborg's ideas of embodied consciousness and kind of the, the anatomy of spirit. Um, oh. And... I, um, and that's really where I think kind of following his story, that's where I think this idea of internal breathing originated is in um, his idea of how the brain actually works. Um, and then it just kind of blossomed and, and became this much more complicated kind of mythologized thing in the theological works, but I think it really starts with um, with his exploration of the brain and embodied consciousness. Could you tell us a little bit about the the history of him engaging with the brain and? Yeah, so um, around 1738, um, Swedenborg left his job working um, as as an assessor of mines for the King of Sweden. And he writes to the King of Sweden a letter saying, um, I really want to uh, go south and spend some time just devoting myself to the study of anatomy. And probably the first place where he talks about um, the brain is in his work on tremulations which he wrote when he was 30, which is one of the first things that he ever published, which is basically um, a kind of vibratory wave theory. And in that book, he says that um, the nervous system uh, is, is kind of runs on uh, tremulations as fast as lightning. So of course he didn't have the concept of electricity. It right? sounds like he was kind of right on for such a, he, he was wrong about a lot, but yeah. he, he was also um, describing a lot of things in the language of his day, which we could describe in a much more specific way nowadays. Um, so like there are certain words that he uses, like, um, you know, the, the word, the, the thing that he calls this energy within the nervous system, which we might call, you know, uh, action potentials. Um, he calls uh, fluctus spiritis, the, uh, the spirit flow or the breath flow because uh, spiro and, and raspiratio are, come from the same Latin word. Um, so if you think about, um, so his, his whole idea of how the brain works is very much dependent on his idea of how breath works. And this um, really shows up in his exploration of the pituitary gland, hmm. which is something that um, he's, he's pretty well known for, um, for having the first really comprehensive I idea of what the pituitary gland does. And he talks about how this sphenoid sinus, um, which is this sinus like way in the back and the top of your, of your sinuses, um, has very subtle movements um, when you breathe. 
And so he says that this movement then had an effect on the pituitary gland and the pituitary gland connects to the thalamus and the thalamus has what are called thalamocortical fibers, which are the, the white matter tracts which move out from the thalamus into the cortex and determine um, the connectome field harmonics or the way that the whole electrodynamic oscillatory structure of the energetic motion of the brain um, is determined. So he was, he was pretty spot on. And one of the things I talk about in, in that video is, um, is, is this experiment that was done where they put electrodes in different places around the limbic system of, of volunteers um, who are actually epileptic patients who are having electrodes put in other parts of the brain to, to track epilepsy. And you can see that when you breathe through your nose, the whole limbic system, which is this whole kind of uh, like central part of the brain, spikes. So it, 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 has a, it has a burst of energy when you, when you breathe through your nose. So you look at all of these you know, worldwide breath control techniques um, and different forms of, forms of yoga and pranayama and stuff. And um, we can see how you know, our, our direct embodied kind of neurological level of consciousness is being entrained and encoded through our breath. Um, yeah. And I, I've heard... I've heard it can calm your, your nervous system. And maybe I think that was in one of your presentations, right? And yeah, so I, I kind of talk huh. about, because um, what, one of the ways that Swedenborg explains this, this internal breathing is that it's a motion in between the belly and, and the brain. And it's kind of this, this oscillation that goes like this. So I went, I, I went to this one study that talks about breathing through the nose. This is kind of this breath up here. And then I went to another study that talks about the vagus nerve mm. and how um, breath control techniques increase your vagal tone, which, chain, which you know, can, can radically improve your mental health um, and you know, a whole slew of other things. Wow. And um, yeah, because I remember the study and, and you saying something about um, how it like, increases your contentment, your positivity, mm -hmm. your sociability and yeah. other things. Wow. And, and all of that is like in the, the, the wiring in between the brain and the heart. And so there's this wonderful little essay that um, we, we kind of dove in. Uh, yeah, that's great. Oh, let's let's yeah. keep diving. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so there's there's this wonderful little essay um, that he writes in. So there are there are two brain books, um, and I think I I think I talked about this the last time I was on, but there's uh, the first one, which is the Venice Manuscript, which is this book, um, which is published by the Swedenborg Scientific Association. Hmm. And this is kind of the more famous one, and it's the first one. And then, like, so this one was 1738 to 1740. And then this one's, like, like four or five years later. It's probably around 1745. Um, so is, he, is he in his 50s-ish? Yeah, so this is, like, right as he's going into his spiritual awakening. Uh, well, um, yeah. And he very clearly in the dream diary says, you know, I'm having all these spiritual experiences as I am studying the brain. And that's really important because as he's studying the brain, he's also been studying breath control. And, do, and, and doing it, right? Wow. Right. And, you know, I see that all coming from uh, this other essay, which is in the second manuscript. Um, and so this manuscript is Codex 55, and this is published as, as the brain. I'm sorry, I picked up the wrong one. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Wait, and so that one's less this one. well known. Interesting. Yeah. So this, one, this one's less, less well known, and it's also published by um, the Swedenborg Scientific Association, but this one's a little bit fragmentary. 
Um, so you can order those online through the, the yeah. Student Scientific yeah. Association? Yeah, um, and the first one's called the Cerebrum and the second one's called the Brain. But the, the second one actually doesn't have the last chunk of this manuscript, um, which was published once I discovered in um, like 1830 and in English as part of the economy of the animal kingdom. But, um, but other than that, like it's, it's, you know, has barely seen the light of day. And that is this one. And this is the Latin. Um, and so within this last chunk um, are kind of what I think some of the most brilliant and fascinating things that Swedenborg wrote. <laughs> and it's all, uh, it's a neuropathology text. Hmm. Um, and so he goes through, let's see, he goes through all sorts of different things. Let me see if I can pull up the... So by neuropathology, what do you mean? Different diseases of the brain. Oh. Um, morbis cerebri. Um, I think is what he calls it. But now are these are these actually like mental diseases in a sense? Yeah. Um, so illness? swooning, syncope, asphyxia, catalepsy. Ecstasy, so he's describing. Or he's describing what they what they look like in the brain, or what what's yeah. he describing there? He's describing what he thinks the neurocorrelates are. Um, what kind of the, the outward um, manifestation of these diseases are. Awesome. Um, somnambulism, uh, the incubus, insomnia, uh, depression, fanatical imagination, loss of memory, alcoholism, stupidity. What do you, what do you find fascinating about that, those, so, uh, that area of the book? I've, I've, I've gone through, I've gone through a lot of it and there are a lot of places where he seems to be kind of spot on in line with a lot of very contemporary thinking. Um, the, the one that I really point to is he identifies the, he has a, a thing on mania and he identifies the, the neurological cause of a manic episode as um, a, a certain inflammation and I forget exactly exactly what part, what part of the brain, but with, within um, within some of the the connections between the medulla and the cortex, hmm. and this idea that mental mental health problems can be caused by inflammation is actually something that there's a lot of research to support. Um, but the, right. the essay, the essay within, within all of these that really caught my attention, um, is the one on ecstasy. Hmm. Let's hear because, it. <laughs> uh, so let's see if I just had it open. Cause it, I'm, I'm assuming he's talking about breath control. Oh, actually, I, I remember from your presentation, he's talking about breath control. Right. So, I. Uh, one of the things that he says about halfway through, uh, I suspect that an alternate cause of ecstasy is the inhibition or suffocation of the respiration of the lungs, while the pulsation of the heart and arteries and the movement of the cerebrum cerebellum, medulla oblongata and spinal cord survives. Wow. So this is where he starts talking about like what, what ab about this, this ecstatic near death state and there were there were other people at his time who were working i forget exactly the name of the guy but um i have it written down somewhere but but there were other people at at um at his time who were working on this question of how do you tell when someone's dead and of course during that time there was this whole scare about people getting like locked in their coffins and so they had like alarm coffins at the time. So this was like, this was a, a big deal in, in his day was wow. how exactly do you term, do, do you determine the, the moment of death? And so I think he starts looking at this question of these ecstatic near death states. Um, Cause that's very much the type of ecstasy he's talking about. 
is like he describes someone getting thrown overboard on a ship and um, having the water pumped out of them and then them describing this this ecstatic near-death experience um and there's like and, a movie about that kind of thing too and and we hear it from other yeah. folks yeah no and and it's kind of it's that. something that i mean the work of of moody of course is is something that swedenborgians love yeah. um and that's you know kind of continuing in the same the same conversation as questioning what this is and one of the um one of the things that shows up in some modern research is this idea that when the heart stops, the brain produces endogenous uh, dimethyltryptamine, um, which is a psychedelic Indeed. compound. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, and that, that has something to do with this reversal of the heart-brain axis. Um, oh. Yeah. Um, and so, and so I, uh, I got interested in this topic of internal breathing when I was very young. Um, I, I used to, and I, I, I have, this is in the, in the video. I, um, I, the only way that I could stay up at night was if I was reading Swedenborg. <laughs> and so my mom would, would let me you know, I, I could get away with staying up for hours if I was, if I was reading the word. And so the book of the word, which I chose being a good Swedenborgian was a spiritual diary. <laughs> and um, so it's just always been one of my favorite texts. And that's where he really gets into some of his, his edgier stuff and his like really deep descriptions of his own experiences. Yeah, quite the, quite the, set of uh, texts and for those who don't know uh, there's a line of Swedenborgians who believe Swedenborg's writings are are scripture yeah yeah um and so you know I I was um I I've been I've been interested in this text forever and I would lie in bed at night and try to do these these breath control techniques that he was <laughs> that he was talking about, and so it's something that it's something that I've been doing all my life, and I um, I you know at the same time these this artwork that's behind you, um, your oh, art, yeah, my artwork, yeah, um, that's behind you. All of those these famous Swedenborgians, yeah, <laughs> from uh, Helen Keller to uh, D T Suzuki, right there. To Carl Jung, Annie Besant's up there. Yeah, thank you for those, by the way. Yeah. Um, but the the inspiration behind those those backgrounds um, was my own kind of interceptive synesthesia. So this idea within Swedenborg that there is this fluctuating spiritis, this this spiritual flow that's that exists on your on your internal the internal levels of of your awareness um is something that i've always i've always been really interested in and that's what those those images are they're attempts to kind of illustrate those that gyrating flow of turning gyres which is just the most beautiful description of a fractal <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty wondrous, and and the right. art is really wondrous. So thank you, for thank for you. all the work that you're doing. I mean, look yeah, at it. I uh, I I'm trying to keep myself busy. Um, yeah. So you yeah. So you were drawn into this idea when you were a kid, sort of like Swedenborg, because then he yeah. say, doesn't he say that he had some breathing techniques even when he was a little kid? right, right. And and so he talks about um, he talks about doing this from the time that he was very young and that this was how he concentrated. Um, and so his initial kind of drive was not, um, I want to talk spirits. Um, his initial drive was really, I want to figure out problems. And so the soul and like the, the embodiment of consciousness for him becomes like an engineering prob problem. And I, I kind of really respect that way of thinking about it. And I think like, even though he gets, like he becomes super theological, it never really goes away. Cause it's always these like kind of mechanistic, you know, the 
the layers of heaven kind of fit together like gears. Um, and, and so, you know, I think, I think there's a really, a really natural, beautiful harmony between um, his way of thinking and the chakra system. Hmm. Um, yeah. That, because oh. he, he just, he describes these, uh, these, you know, gyrating forms of turning gyres um, and places them within parts of the body very specifically. And there's, um, he copies it in a, into a couple of places, but there's this this beautiful spiritual experience that he has that I actually I didn't include in the video, but I I thought would be nice to kind of bring up because um, he describes uh, four points of action in the heavenly body that are the places where influx um, flows flows from the, the heavenly realm into the into the physical realm. And this is Arcana Celestia uh, 3884. Um, so he goes from the left temple, which he identifies as the organs of reason. So the left side of the brain is reason and the right side of the brain is will. Sounds very modern. <laughs> Thinking it's well. very, it's pretty accurate. <laughs> and I actually, I think, cause there's a lot of like the left brain, right brain discourse that I don't like so much. But um, I actually really love Swedenborg's description because he, he goes back and forth. But um, so at the beginning, it switches. And then, and then he's kind of like unsure. But then by the time he gets to the Arcana, which is 1750-ish, uh, um, he's, uh, he's, pretty, he's pretty set that the left side of the brain is reason. Um, you know, the, the understanding of truth and the right side of the brain is, is will or the will to good. And then that involves love, right? Yeah. Um, so this, this love and truth dichotomy becomes like a hemispheric dichotomy. Hmm. And he also, you know, one of the like really beautiful moments in, um, in, in his work on the brain, one of the first places that I can find him using the word conjugial rather than conjugal. Um, but one of the first places that I can- anyway, Talking about love. Uh, yeah, I, I, so talking about, but specifically like this sexual marriage love um, mm. that's also like a cosmic principle. Um, and you know, that word wasn't like, it wasn't a word that's regularly used. It actually seems like he, he was a classicist um, and it seems like he got it from uh, Ovid's Ars Amatoria. Um, I might be saying that wrong. Because <laughs> he wasn't but, using, as you said, he wasn't using the word we normally associate, like conjugal. Yeah. Um, at least in English. No, he, that he that kind of eye is in it. there. And he very specifically puts that eye in there. And <laughs> it's um, the, so one of the only people who uses that word extensively is Ovid and he uses it in a work called Ars Amatoria and this is this explicitly sexual book about you know the art of love the, the Ars Amatoria and um, so that sexual connotation seems to be something that he's pulling through from Ovid um, but one of the first places that he uses the word conjugalis is in his description of the way that the hemispheres interact. Hmm. Okay. Um, so, and it's, it's, it's kind of vague because I've looked at, the, at this passage a couple of times and it's kind of vague to see whether he is talking about left brain, right brain, or whether he's talking about cerebrum cerebellum because mm -hmm. he, he talks about both relationships. Um, but I think they're really um, two different manifestations of duality, and he could be describing either one. Which, um, and they kind of uh, mirror the structure of heaven, according to him, both yeah. cerebrum cerebellum and... And, and, there, and this is, you know, one of the, the quotes that I think I had in there um, is he says that uh, the heavenly form in its most intimate sphere was the form of the churning circumvolutions that are visible in human brains. Um, and that, that uh, so, so there's something like really beautiful about that idea that just as the brain is 
the seat of our individual and body consciousness. The brain is the seat of the most intimate conjugal relationship within the grand human of heaven. And so that duality becomes this beautiful kind of fractal that comes out and out and out into the world um, and is manifested in our consciousness as it is. And uh, it's just sounds like something, well, please. No, go, go on. Yeah, it sounds like something that I hear about a lot um, in, in culture today about kind of the universe being a hologram and yeah. um, this like over consciousness and the, the microcosm, the macrocosm yeah. fitting together. And I think, I think that's something that, you know, shows up in, in traditions all over the world because it's true. <laughs> um, there's also ideas of, um, of like quantum physics and consciousness, which I'm not sure I, I know enough about <laughs> to, to really talk about. Um, but this idea that you can you can see consciousness as a waveform which collapses at the point of observation. Mm. And so when you're looking at the brain itself, so you can, you can kind of see the body as a continuum from, you know, the, the natural, the most external physical sensory plane, which is out here. And then as that information moves, inward closer and closer to your brain um and we could also talk about it moving up through the chakras um going from you know this this state down here up through a heart and lungs consciousness into a vocal consciousness into you know consciousness of consciousness within within the brain in itself you can think about it um like each of these points along your body shortens the feedback loop and so eventually when you get to the point where your focus is is within the brain itself you can gain consciousness of consciousness and you can observe the observer um in a way that kind of short circuits the whole system um and that's you know that moment of awakening so we look at someone like swedenborg and he's performing breath control techniques he's um studying the brain and he's, you know, increasingly, you know, through this intense focus, bringing his awareness from this external breath up and up and up through the brain itself. And I actually, I, I digress because I was, I was um, going through these four points that he talks about in the Arcana, and I really wanted to, hmm. to get hmm. through that list. So the first one um, is, is the point at the left temple, um, the seat of reason. And then the second one, it moves to the, the respiration of the lungs, which controls speech. And this is something that he talks about over and over again. It's really central to this whole idea of internal breathing that he says um, people in the most ancient church or people like the people in the most ancient church, which is really important because um, you can like, easily debate the historicity of this <laughs> yeah, so and like, like, yeah. right so so he has he has this concept of of the churches and that you know basically all of humanity is developing together into higher and higher states of consciousness um and that you know yeah. it goes it goes from most ancient to ancient um to uh, is israelitish um to christian to new Although, right, he, when he talks about the most ancient and the ancient, he often talks about them in kind of higher terms because they had a, like early humans had a deep right. connection with divinity as far as he was concerned. Right, right. So, yeah. so it's, it's, he's very, you know, I, I call myself a pagan Borgian, but it, it's really going back to this, this idea of, of the, the ancient church and, and the most ancient church as something which had, you know, incredible highs um, but then also, you know, really fell and you get, you know, human sacrifice cults and, you know, mm -hmm. and, and all, and all of this awful stuff, which, which he was aware of, but, you know, it, it's an awareness that, you know, you don't have to go back to all of the, the evil that you came out out of. And I think this really applies to like, 
you know, the conversation we're having right now about, about white supremacy um, and about, um, you know, all of, a lot of our racial issues, I think, I think are all tied up in this, um, that when you go back into, into what your ancestors have done, you can acknowledge that they fucked up. You can acknowledge that, um, you know, that there's a lot of horror and a lot of pain in, in your background, but, you know, they have fallen states and they have enlightened states. And so right now, I think we're dealing with the fallout from the fall of the Christian church, um, which, you know, there's, this is kind of another, an, another kind of pet thing of mine, but I think, you know, it's important to say it in this moment that Swedenborg acknowledges, he, he talks about, he's talking about spirits in a hellish state who um, are in an extremely externalized state where they have no awareness of, of what's going on in their internal selves. And these spirits in, of the, in this externalized state, he talks about, he says, the only thing that I can think of to possibly like compare to the, the, the hell that they're in is the Spaniards going after the heathen women and children with dogs and beasts. So he directly compares a, an externalization of our spiritual lives to colonialism. That's really and, going yet. Yeah, and, and, and so it's like, oh, right now we're dealing with the fallout of the fall of the Christian church. And it shows up, you know, in the the hell of a society that we built for ourselves. Yeah, um, to him, it's the hell isn't that people aren't Christian, right? It's that no matter what our religion, we can embody hell. Yeah. And be oriented towards colonialism or domination. Or, or what have you know, you. And this this externalization, however, however that looks. Um, and the epitome of that state for him was, you know, conquistadors sending dogs after native women and children in Mexico. Um, so he was aware of that. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's, that's really, really important to keep in mind. Um, well, so, yeah, today, I think, yeah, you're right on. It's, it's interesting that he w would call it out in that way. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, we don't hear a lot of <laughs> folks in Europe calling out colonialism, as far as I can tell. Right. So, yeah. Right. But he, uh, it, it, it's, it's a really, it's an interesting number. Um, and I don't, I don't have it written down right now, but it's, uh, if you type Spaniards into a search of the spiritual diary, you'll find it. Um, yeah, so did you get through your four, the four points? The, no, the, I didn't. <laughs> so there's uh, the, right. the point in, in the left, in the left temple, there's the breathing of the lungs um which he said is is controlled by by spirits by by respiro and spiro is has this relationship again um and then the heartbeat mm. um and then the kidneys so you can see it kind of um this energy moving down and one of the things that he says is that spirits in the most ancient church, um, how he identifies the fall of the most ancient church is that their breathing patterns started out up here and then they drop and they drop and they drop and they drop and they get to a point where they're breathing from a point that's so low down, so it's like such a, such a root shocker breath that they suffocate wow. themselves. So it's, it's like the description of becoming more yeah, root chakra based and maybe like lustful and dominated. And external. And um, external, yeah. Yeah. That hellishness that you talked about being just oriented towards the external world and not giving credit to right. people's emotions and spiritual life. And, right. And and that's faith alone. Um, uh, and like which, faith you alone know, saves. Is, is the only, is, is one of the things that he most strongly identifies with the fall of the Christian church is that y'all got so obsessed with being right that you forgot how to be kind mm, you yeah. were like oh we have to go save the heathens we have to go you know sail sail across the ocean you know with a with a, yeah. with a cross to, to convert all of these people 
you know, and it doesn't matter that we're killing off 95% of the Native Americans, and it doesn't matter that, you know, we're completely devaluing human life. It doesn't matter that, you know, all of this horror is, is happening because we forgot how to be kind. Um, and so that's the hell that we're up against yeah. Yeah. in this moment. Um, and so, really? you know, it, I've, I've kind of made it my own, my own thing to be, you know, if we have this method that he talks about of opening up your internal states through an increasingly deep awareness of your interoception of your own body, then we should be using it. Um, because I think, you know, this, this state of externalization is not, it's not doable. Um, it's not sustainable. Um, and we're seeing right now, you know, very clear evidence that it's, it's not sustainable environmentally, it's not sustainable socially. Um, and the only way, you know, as, as individuals that we spiritually survive that is by going back into our, into our internal states. And um, so I, you know, I think that there's a lot of, you know, perfectly valid, very Marxist critique about spirituality being something that ultimately, you know, this, this idea of, of becoming a, a, a transcendent, you know, you transcend so much that you lose touch with, with reality. You just, you kind of suck yourself up into some, into some other dimension up here and uh, you don't have to worry about all the suffering. That's and, just called an idiot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, so what I'm, what I'm seeing in this very clear description of, you know, this breath that's happening within the nervous system, this subtle breath, this heavenly breath, um, you, you know, I'm, I'm seeing something that goes all the way from, from a divine state and, and then comes all the way down to manifests itself in the reality of embodied consciousness. And so to me, like, that's the second coming of Christ is is how do you embody love and wisdom in your actual experience um you know all the way to the to the dendrite to the to the to the individual ion flowing along along an axon and see that that coursing spiritual energy that is the basis of your consciousness is something which manifests in the world through the world and so you have to make the world a better manger for christ to be born yeah yeah and well, that's uh, beautiful and yeah. i think well put but we have to receive divinity in our lives and i mean what else really matters to us individually the, the second coming of christ could be you know yeah god flying in on a cloud <laughs> hoverboard <laughs> if it's not incarnating in your spirit and your soul what does it matter to at least you specifically and right i think you're right. right yeah and and i think that's really you know what makes something the word um mm -hmm. is can you does it reflect in you um and this is this idea of um the what 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 we used to call the one man principle um or the one human principle um, and that's this idea that when, when you look at a sacred text, how you tell whether it's sacred is whether or not it can relate to anyone, is whether or not it can, um, it can contain a, a universal metaphor for internal spiritual development. And that doesn't mean that, you know, the you know, and, and Swedenborg goes to the Bible because that's, that's his culture. And the Bible then becomes the most precious and perfect thing because it's the thing that he spends the most time with. But I think, I think you could do it with the Poetic Edda, you could do it with the Devi Gita, you could do it with uh, the Quran. Um, and it's, it's really yeah. the question that I think, that I always ask myself when I approach a sacred text um, is, how am I, how am I applying this to my own spiritual life? And how is this teaching me specifically how to grow exactly where I am? And that's, that's what makes it sacred. Um, that's, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. And that 
there are many ways to connect with divinity. And sometimes that scripture or that inspiration in our lives is just our experience and or striving and to listen to God. The the thing that the thing that you know I've been I've been focusing on so much is how because Swedenborg says that um, people in the most ancient church had the word written on their hearts. You've heard this phrase. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's just, that's something that really stuck with me because, you know, you can, you can think of it of like writing on a heart or you can think of it like, no, there's something about the motion of the heart. There's something about the experience of having a heartbeat that reminds us of God. There's something about the experience, the way the breath affects our body, um, that can teach us something. There's something about, you know, when we sit in interoception, when we sit in meditation and you go deeper and deeper along your own, you know, neurologically moderated anatomical like field of awareness, you get closer and closer to, you know, some essential realization. Um, and so, you know, I think there's, there's loads of of traditions that do this, um, and and specifically yeah. specifically uh, tantras is is something that um, I really love, and uh, kriya yoga I think is a really I wanna, beautiful. I want to ask you more about the breath and, and yeah. where Swedenborg was going with that because I think you're uh, you you be beautifully connect it to things like uh, tantra and, and yoga and how Swedenborg was kind of keying into these practices that I've often been uplifted as real tools, real, you know, human tools for human, um, you know, transcendence, like to yeah. find, to become a transcendent, to rise above the id. Uh, and yet Swedenborg doesn't always write, like he doesn't always write or not even often write about being practical about spirituality in that way. This yeah. is something you found in his diary. So I'm curious right. how that kind of ties into to what you're saying. Right, because because his his practicality. Well, there's a there's a couple different different ways that you can and approach this. First of all, he didn't have any awareness of yoga traditions that we know about. Um, you know, he he was aware that there were um, heathens in Asia. That's, that's as far as as far as he goes. And and you know, in in this beautiful quote where he he says, you know the population of Europe is approximately 10% of the world. And this is the only place where Christianity is the norm. So how could you possibly think that only Christians go to heaven? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what about the heathens in, in, in Asia and America? And so that, that's about his, his, it, the, the limit of his awareness um, that, that yoga was even a thing. Um, so the place where I do see it, um, it coming from actually is traditions of uh, far north shamanism. Um, and so Linnaeus, the kingdom phylum class order family genus species guy, um, was actually a good friend of Swedenborg's. And he, at the same time that Swedenborg went south to Venice to study the brain, Linnaeus went north to um to lapland uh, to study plants but he also ended up writing a lot about um the the tribes that lived up there the indigenous people that lived up there who were like the sami and other groups hmm. and one of the things that he brings back with him is uh this description which i found a while ago and I've been trying to track down because none of these things, texts are easily searchable but there's a description that Swedenborg has of um, of this experience of an internal kind of photistic light and in this essay on ecstasy he talks about um, the 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 Sami and the the Lapland um, the shamans of Lapland uh, going into ecstatic trance states while playing drums. And so he has this awareness of ancient indigenous European cultures 
that are pre-Christian. So, and then, you know, if you take the kind of shamanic perspective seriously, if you're using breath to go into trance states, to talk to spirits um, on a spirit plane, you know, who are you talking to? And all, all around the world, you know, who are you contacting? And there's, you know, I, I personally, I think he's talking to his own ancestors. Um, and I, so I think that if there's, if there's a root for what he's doing, um, the root is in, is in indigenous European traditions, but it's also, he's strongly influenced by Kabbalah. Um, so yeah. there's, there's all of this, all of this stuff that goes into Swedenborg and Swedenborg then reinterprets and, and appropriates it in, in his own way, but he develops this incredibly sophisticated kind of interceptive meditation technique and meditation practice um, out of looking at the brain and looking at breath as a universalizing uh, human experience. And um, I think I veered far off of your original question. I think well, you, you hit on some really great stuff there. And yeah. Yeah, we don't often talk much about the indigenous cultures in, in Europe and how yeah. they um, were still around in, in many places and, and yeah. their traditions are, are somewhat around now and that there's an interaction to some degree between um, the different cultures. That's, it's amazing to hear. And it's funny that you mentioned a drum and you've been mentioning heartbeat because yeah. I, there's been a kind of a heartbeat noise. I think, I don't know if it's your desk or, or what it is. <laughs> But it's been, it's like a very round noise and it kind of fits perfectly. Um, yeah. So maybe we'll all end up in a trance by the end of yeah, the Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully. That's, awesome. That's the idea. <laughs> <laughs> but no, um, it's actually beautiful. And so, yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, it's, it's, it's completely fascinating. And just the idea that, you know, you can go, like you take, you take a, a Hindu Swami's brain <laughs> and you take and you take you know my brain or whatever you you can't really the the nervous system works the same anywhere so when you start your spirituality from from the point of the body you really do get this this kind of universalizing perspective that at the same time it's not it's not trying to blend everything together. It's the saying, it's saying that our embodiment um, is what gives us empathy, is what, is what allows us to, you know, to communicate across cultural experience. Um, and I think, I think that's a really, a really powerful idea. And, you know, cause I think, I think that textual exegesis is is very important and i'm glad that people do it and i think that there's there's a strong place for it but i also i see my own kind of project as one of of anatomical exegesis um of, of looking at looking at the brain and the human body in general but my own my own body um as as a text um through which we can realize uh, divine consciousness, and as you know, a, a a vehicle to to take us to higher and deeper states of awareness, um, which I think Swedenborg was a master at, and I think it's our birthright to do the same thing. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I think there's a reason why in the West we're we're being pulled towards some of these. Eastern traditions that maintain that. And yeah. I think what we often miss is the spiritual lens. I mean, we'll get some of it from our yoga teacher sometimes, uh, but to really, like, I think identifying, not identifying, but engaging with it on, on each level allows yeah. for its true power because, you know, you're, you're talking about um, exegesis from the body and, and that, it sounds like you mean engaging with it like spiritually, mentally, uh, through practice, breathing practice, and reflection, and uh, how how wonderful! Yeah, it's a it's it's a gift. I mean, and it's and it's it's so exciting that you know being able to approach this. 
and then and then you know approach all of these sacred traditions as as sacred and and as something um as something that's just it's right here you know and and so i i'm really i've always been a little bit suspicious of this this concept of the other world um like we think of it as like you know, there, there's this natural plane and then there's the spiritual plane and you know we're not meant to be aware of like how how they contact each other but i i think i think you know swingboard kind of goes goes back and forth on like how exactly this works and the principle of correspondences is the place where they connect and that's these these four points that he that he talks about the brain the heart the lungs and the kidneys um and when you actively put that in your body um with like your full somatic awareness it's completely different than than thinking about it kind of it, it's just it 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 it's complete it's not intellectual um it's it's embodied and and deeply alive and you know that's that's the divine human because because jesus christ had to have a body jesus christ had to have all of these all of these organs and all of these structures and aligning your own embodied consciousness to this divine grand human um through these these points um allows that flow to work and one of the one of the quotes that i have in the in the video is he talks about the discrete gyres showing up at these points and then how through meditation they all connect Oh wow! They all, and it goes from yeah. from separate kind of places of energy, and then they all flow together. And so it's it's you know it aligns with this natural spiritual celestial, or natural spiritual celestial. I think you can do it either way. Um, but there's a point where, with from the spiritual state of consciousness, um, they 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 all they all flow as one. Um, and they're all, they're, they're discrete degrees, but it's the, it's the motion between the degrees that creates reality. And, Which really uh, ties into a lot of what, what folks say about chakras and the yeah. energies, as you're yeah. pointing out. Yeah. It's and powerful. I think that's because, you know, they're both observing something that's real. And these are two, <laughs> two different systems, um, which, which should be approached in their own right. And, and, you know, I, I think that, I think that we can we can appreciate both of them um, without you know appropriating too much. Um, but you look at and you have two different people without any contact on opposite ends of the world, and they're talking about the same thing. Well, maybe there's some deeper truth that's in between both of them, and it's that that deeper embodied experience um, that's not really something that can be explained with words. Um, that I'm really interested in. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. So real embodiment and empowerment. Yeah, and uh, I think I think that 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 idea of of living praxis is something that that the church des desperately needs. Um, yeah, because ultimately, I mean, if if we're going to live into these things internally to the external um, to how we behave and behave in society doesn't that mean fighting for justice and being willing right. to be that meditative actionable presence right in situations that, like what we see today and that we don't have we don't have faith if we don't have charity mm -hmm. we don't have we don't have love if we don't have truth um and you know constantly remembering that faith alone is the fall of the christian church and faith alone is is the thing that that got us wherever the hell we are today, um, as far as our our whole kind of social social state and our social social problems. Um, you know, I really think faith alone is deeply embedded in all of them, and the only way out of faith alone is is through charity and empathy, and love for the neighbor, 
and a deep acknowledgement that, you know, even though we have vast, you know, and possibly irreparable cultural divides, we are all experiencing a divine field of consciousness within our embodied lives. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, that's a deeply healing truth for me. And I don't, uh, mm. yeah. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. If nothing else, faith alone condemns everyone who's not in your church to hell. Yeah. And I know some people will hold pretty hard and fast to that idea. Yeah. Uh, but I think you're right that that lack of the care and, and charity and love and empathy. Um, yeah, it doesn't really allow for the heaven within to bloom, let alone without. Right. right. Yeah. And and so, you know, the where where the idea of internal breathing goes as you as you look at Swedenborg's life lifetime, because it starts out as this very anatomical idea that this is something that has to do with you know the the oscillatory vibratory motion of the brain and then you know very you know gradually over you know 20 20 years of writing it becomes uh it it, it becomes the the oscillatory patterns between divine love and wisdom within uh the grand human and, and god himself god themselves god herself um and so it 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 becomes more and more abstracted, but even even in TCR, even at the very end of his life, Swedenborg is still talking about the anatomy. He's still constantly bringing it back to the anatomy, and constantly, you know, if if we don't make something useful, if we don't make something you know functional for human beings as they are, then you know you're not doing anything you're 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 screwing around because <laughs> it, it it has to it has to come down into into praxis whether it's internal praxis or external praxis and and you, i'm i'm a firm believer that you need both because if you're just sitting there you know doing yoga in a cave it's you know it it's nice and you, sometimes there's a time for that yeah there's a there there's a time for that yeah. but i think i think the point of those kind of internal explorations is to then turn around and teach someone else hmm. to, to turn turn around and, and help your community feed someone plant a garden um and you know that's what makes it it complete but the more we can open ourselves up to our internal states the more satisfaction and the more of an experience of, of this heavenly bliss we're going to have when when we actually go out and perform our uses and that seems to be like the place where he gets to in these like high theological works like divine love and wisdom is this idea that um is this idea that that it has to it has to manifest in how we actually treat each other mm -hmm. and uh and that that's the second coming of christ and, but it's coming all the way from like, from the neurological correlates um, and from the kind of quantum vibratory, more like scientific end, end of stuff. It's coming all the way from that and then all the way out and manifesting in our, in our actual social experience. Amazing. <sighs> and I think you've gotten the, that point across that, that the breathing can help. So if yeah. I wanted to kind of um, employ some of what you've learned in terms of breathing, yeah. what would you say? I think that one of the, one of the most helpful places that I've found him talking about is um, a, the part in, let me just see it, uh, the, the kind of four steps that show up in the spiritual diary number 3464. Yeah, that's the one I wrote down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's that's the really good Your one. That he, are great. Yeah. He 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 talks about um this four step process by which you know uh pre Adamite spirits, which I love. So so these spirits in a state of just extreme extreme innocence, uh, you know, neonatal spirits, 
Um, so, so that kind of state is the state where you have to really get yourself to is this, this, the, the state of the very first memory, which is also something in transcendental meditation. Wow. Um, kind right. Of like what Jesus said about becoming, you have to become like a child to enter. Exactly. The exactly. So, so these, these, these spirits are, uh, from this very, very, uh, innocent state are introduced from external breathing into internal breathing and he says it goes by four steps and the first step is this the type of of breathing that i use right now the type of breathing that you use when you talk which is a very externalized form of breath and then slowly that breath gets 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 minimized gets lessened and you become aware that there's also a breath that's happening through the nervous system that's, that there's this pulsation of energy and and am i right in thinking that like when you're kind of um calming your breathing you try to breathe out s long for longer like yeah your nose? And, and that's that's how how they say that you um you activate the, the vagus nerve hmm. um and it's it's in through the nose which and trains your limbic system and then out through the mouth and that and that long exhalation that's going up from the belly um actually strengthens your vagal tone oh yeah is it out through the mouth oh i didn't know that well it, there's lots of different of different systems um and swedenborg doesn't specifically talk about it but one of the things that he does talk about is this idea that you have kind of a long wave form that's the the respiration of the lungs that's that's the normal breathing that's the slowest thing and then there's the heartbeat mm. and so there's there's kind of a fast wave form of the heartbeat and a slow wave form of of the lungs and then in the brain he talks about how the the motion of the lungs entrains the the spiritus flux, the electrodynamic oscillations of um, of the cerebrum itself, of the actual nerve fibers, but then the heartbeat uh, controls how the actual blood vessels spread out. And so he talks about the the space between the nerve fibers and the heartbeat as having this other waveform. Wow. So, and it's, it's actually a lot like the Schrodinger equation, if that's I, I, a total uh, <laughs> thing, but, but you can, you can think of it, about it along, along these, these kind of oscillatory mathematical ways where you have, you have the quick heartbeat and you have the slow motion of, of the lungs. And then there's a third, um, like interference pattern that shows up in between these two, um, these two wavelengths. Hmm. And he talks about these, this breath of, of the brain being quicker than the breath of the lungs. And I found that, and you know, I, I don't know, I, I can feel it um, when I'm in a deep state of state of meditation and you know, it, it, and so it was so exciting to me to uh, start looking at Kriya Yoga because it's saying it, it's, it's like exactly the same thing. And, it, and so for me, it was kind of like, oh, you can feel this. Mm -hmm. um, and lots of people throughout history have said, you can feel this, you can learn to be aware of the, the electrodynamic motion of energy through the brain. And mm -hmm. So I think that he, he sets up these, these four steps where you go from the, the external breath to the subtle breath, and then the external breath drops away. And he said he would spend an hour without breathing. And as the external breath drops away, that motion of the nervous system becomes uh, dominant. And that's that ecstatic state. And as you go into that ecstatic state, eventually you become aware of an even subtler level of breathing. That's the angelic breath. And the angelic breath is, is, is like almost, 
almost un unfeelable. Um, but the fact that, you know, we see people having these kind of these ecstatic experiences um, shows us that it's actually relatively easy to train yourself to move from the, the external respiration into a, a respiration that's based around um, the electrodynamics of the nervous system. We should note that it probably does take some training and, and you want to be safe yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and, and it's like, if you just try to hold your breath for until you pass out. Don't force it, not, please. That's not the point. <laughs> that's, that's, not. Not, that's not what you're doing. And, and it, does, it, takes, it takes years, but the, the fact of the matter is, lots of people do this, you know, it's, it's not, it's not impossible. And one of the things he says is that um, he would, when he's, when he's in these deep trance states, he would only breathe enough to think. Hmm. So it's, it's, it's moving enough air. It's not holding your breath. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of stopping your own control of, of your breath. It's allowing heaven to breathe for you is, is how he describes it that you, um, you, go, you get into a, a state where you're no longer initial, initiating every breath, where you actually feel um, this spirit, spiritual influx that moves through the brain um, and actually uh, gives you just enough, just enough oxygen to, to stay in, in, a, in a cognitive state. Um, and then, of course, you know, after years of years and years of practice, Swedenborg was able to, you know, go deeper and deeper and deeper into, into this kind of near death state and have all of these experiences. And, um, you know, I, I'm not I'm not really interested in in teaching people to talk to dead people like <laughs> like that's not that's not the, the interesting part here. I'm I'm really interested in teaching people to get into deeper levels of their own, um, their own internal awareness yeah. and how to use that Amazing. Um, to, you know, be happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Experience cosmic transcendent bliss. Why not? <laughs> yeah, uplift heavenliness. What, whether yeah. or not you think there's a heaven, we, we can clearly experience hell on earth. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But I think I think heaven is also is also just as as accessible um, if you're in the right state of mind. I'm, can I ask one more question about meditation? Just because I'm, yeah. I'm kind of geeking out, and then we'll <laughs> we'll probably close here soon. Sure. Um, thanks so much. This has been amazing. Yeah. No, so this has been a lot of fun. Oh, cool. Um, when you are entering your meditative journeys or, or meditations, or when Swedenborg was, what? What do you often do with your thinking? How do you focus that, or what do you, how do you enter a meditative space for those? Yeah. Who are on that? So I have I have really bad OCD. Um, <laughs> I have all, all my life. Like I've never been able to just like clamp down and like control my thinking and just like get get my get my brain to just, to just yeah. stop. It's it's tough. Um, but so the thing that I I have to do. Um, because I, I, I have, I have a lot of trouble just like dropping straight into it. The thing that I have to do is really to increase my awareness of something that's happening synesthetically and then get myself to be excited about it. And so if I can learn to follow a single internal sensation, then as you as you take that, like, as, as you take that concentrated kind of ball of awareness and you move it upwards, it naturally moves into deeper and deeper levels of interoceptive awareness. And so for me, the, the anatomy part of meditation became really important because, you know, the brain then becomes, or the whole body then becomes a tool. Um, and a tool which if you kind of transcend through these these spiritist gyres in the right way, you know, you'll get yourself in, into a meditative state that you're excited about. You get and, and you're like, oh wow, this is incredible. You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to be focusing on anything else. 
because I'm so excited to to be focused on on this internal light. Um, and so amazing. Yeah, and and I think I think that's the only the only way that that I'm able to kind of drop in into that into that samadhi state is if I have some kind of some kind of a ritual um, and some kind of a, of a path to follow. Um, and I think that's that's why these systems exist. Well, well, perfect. I think I think I'll find that really helpful. I, I'm sure our listeners will as well. It's, this has been such a gift, Ellie. If, if people want to learn more, where do they go? And you mentioned um, the video. So I I have several videos on my YouTube channel, and uh, you can you can tune into those. Um, and if you want to ask questions in those, I'll I'm. I'm happy to help. I also have, um, I'm very, very open and available on, on Facebook and Instagram, um, where I'm Eleanor Schnartist on Instagram. And um, if anyone's interested in kind of supporting my research um, in, a more, in a more concrete way, I also have a Patreon uh, that's Eleanor Schnartist. A Patreon. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, perfect. And if they want to find your video, I'm sure it's under Swedenborg Internal Breathing. Um, yeah, it's called Animate Flux, Animate an introduction Flux. to Swedenborg's internal breathing, and it's on my YouTube channel, which is under Eleanor Schnarr. Oh, and, wonderful. Uh, yeah, and, and we can link that in the description. Yeah, for sure. It'll be right at the top, folks, so please check that out. And uh, yeah, again, this has been wonderful. I've, I've been amazed, really. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, our pleasure, and we, we want to have you on again soon. So let's let's keep uh, in connection and. Uh, of course, anytime. Yeah. Well, you you've been a great friend, um, and and you and and Tom and all those folks in Berkeley. Say hi, say hi to everyone for me. I will. Oh, hi from Berkeley, and you're still in Canada, right? Yep, still in Ontario, uh, with the Church of the Good Shepherd and the online yep. community. Yeah, um, yeah, and uh, it's it's great. The the Swedenborgian community, uh, for those who don't know, is is a, a wonderful one. Uh, I, I I'm always amazed by uh, the heart, the insight, the the wisdom, truly. And and so, um, please subscribe if you're if you're watching this and uh, feel inspired. And um, yeah, let's let's uh, let's say. Uh, as a goal, before our next uh, connection on the online community, we each take some time to work on um, some breathing, reflecting on Ellie's words of, of deep insight and, and maybe share uh, what the experience has been like for us. So Thank you so again. much. Thank you so much. Awesome. Bye, folks. See you soon.